Hi, Tammy. This is Joseph from Juno. Hi, Joseph. Hey, how are you? Uh, I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm just here checking in to see if there's any issues uh, that you're encountering. Um, I just got on. I think everything is all okay right now. Hey, team. Hey, Tamid. Hey, Shruti. Sorry about hey, that. Hey, Joseph. Just looking out of this session. <laughs> but... Okay. Um, are, you, are you guys all good and set to go? Breakout rooms, Joseph? Uh, so for breakout rooms, it's actually it's too late to do that at this point. Um, We're no longer able to add breakout rooms. Um, mm -hmm. So will you, uh, so how is the session going to be ran? Like, are you guys wanting to ask questions to the audience or something like that? Yeah, yep. So we've got... I mean, the intended flow is to introduce an activity, have them in small breakouts to do the activity and share and really connect with one another, and then have a bit of sharing from our side where there'd be chances for them to respond either in the chat box or if the numbers weren't too big even to perhaps unmute themselves and share their thoughts as well. So that was the sort of rough yeah. um, structure. So I think we got a request, I don't know, Friday or Thursday night or something prior to the event uh, about breakout rooms, but it was way too late to add those at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't a way for, I mean, yeah, it was way too late to, to add those. So my suggestion to you guys is if you guys want to do some kind of interaction, um, there is an opportunity for them to raise their hand and then you mm -hmm. can bring them on stage where they can turn on their camera and mic. It's not going to be in smaller groups. Um, so the logistics of that is so when you ask them as, as a facilitator for this session, all that you need to do is ask them to raise their hand. When they raise their hand, you see the QA tab to the right there. So you have chat, QA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, click, uh, yeah. So when they raise their hand, their name is going to pop up in QA. And then you would just click on the actual raise hand uh, emoji icon that will show up on there. And it will allow them to go on stage. It's pretty simple. Like you have, you also have moderators in this room who can help you with that as well. So that brings Great. me to the last tab on this one, which is the mod tab. That's behind the scene conversation. So between us, you know, the Juno team, Global Youth and MCI. So if you have any questions, experiencing technical difficulties, just hop in that. Um, the mod pad panel, is that right? Should yeah, the mod um, yeah. chat window. Mm -hmm. And yeah. all that's all behind the scenes. So if you need help someone bringing someone on stage, just drop a comment in there and we'll help you out with that as well. Great. Okay. Hey, Joseph, we've got another facilitator. Her name is Shun and she joined our group a bit later after the original session was decided. She's not able to get in to this. Do you know if you'd be able to give her access or Let see, me see what that's... What's her name? Do you want to type it in there? Yeah, that would be great. Type it in the mod chat as well if possible so that the it doesn't show in, in the public chat. Okay. When so what we could do... Based on Joseph's feedback, Tamid, for the community mapping, we could invite yeah. even two or three of them to share it publicly with the whole group. You know, yeah, if yeah. they feel comfortable yeah. to walk it through, that would still be yeah. um, pretty interesting. Yeah I, think, yeah, I think that makes sense. Rather than them doing it in breakout rooms, they just do it publicly. Um, that's the name, Joseph. Okay. S-E-U-N-O. just realized there should be a space between the N and the O. Okay. I've added her to the uh, to this session here, so ask her if she can refresh her page, and she should be able to get in the green room with you guys. Okay. So how does the share screen function work? So you click on share desktop. Yeah, 
Yep. Um, so you click on the third icon uh, there, which is the share desktop icon. Yep. Once you click on that one, uh -huh. um, you have the opportunity to share entire screen, window, or Chrome tab. Okay. There you go. Uh, so you are sharing now, and I'm able to see it. Uh, so you don't need to... So right now, what you're probably seeing on the Juno platform itself is like yourself and then like publishing desktop. Mm -hmm. But you can switch into that tab at any point and you'll be fine. Okay. Yeah, so we're able to see it. One thing I would recommend for you to do when you start screen sharing is to just remind the attendees that they can enlarge their screen by clicking on the expand window okay. um, down at the bottom right corner. They should already be familiar with it now that mm -hmm. it's the third day. But it's just a good reminder. Okay. Okay. Cool. Hi, so I'm glad you made it. Um, is there anybody else missing from your speaker list? Mm -hmm. no. Thanks for that, Joseph. Yeah. Of course. All right. We're well. You've got about 19 minutes left of your time. Feel free to run through some slides. Relax. Grab a water. Do what you got to do. But it's going to be a great show. I'm excited for you guys. Great. Thank you. Do you have a sense, Joseph, of how many people will expect in the session? In this session, so usually we're averaging, if I'm not mistaken, lately um, about 100, 200 just in the Juno platform itself per wow. session. Wow. Um, Solid, yeah. Yeah. So that's just in the Juno platform. You guys are being broadcasted on, broadcasted in YouTube, uh, Facebook, I think, as well, and other platforms. There's like seven, six or seven other broadcasts that's happening from this platform. Uh, so you are able to reach a larger crowd outside of Juno. Okay, great. Yeah, so that should be exciting. Um, more importantly, more it's, it's impactful, so. Yeah. Are we able um, to share the slides? So I just realized that we can't, I mean, I like uh, share the link to the slides with them. Um, oh, that's a global summit question. I'm not quite sure for the regulations. I think they've shared it before. Um, okay. What I would suggest for you to do is just drop the link in the mod chat yeah. later on and then ask the moderator. The moderators would know more because they are actually with the summit itself. So they would be the ones to kind of help you make that decision. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Well, we'll be in here. Uh, we just won't be on camera or you, we won't be on screen, but we're, we are in this room. So if you have any questions, feel free to just kind of say it out loud or drop it in the mod chat again. Uh, we'll monitor that. And you guys should be good to go. Brilliant. Perfect. Good luck, guys. Have fun. Thanks, Joseph. So good to you're good to run the slides, Tamin. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. Um... Let me share the slides. Can you see them? Yeah, perfect. And is there a way that I can expand the slides? Yeah. Um, oh, okay, I keep forgetting. <laughs> we asked about the breakout rooms. Like, is that is it possible? Yeah. So, Sean, um, we don't have breakout rooms. Okay. Uh, not possible. So, um, I guess what you can do in your reflection um, okay. is basically where, get people to raise their hands, and then you can click on the individual in the chat. And then in the Q&A section, and then they can come on and share their feedback. Okay, so do you know how to do that? Say that again. Jen, are you trying to talk right now? Yeah, I was saying that um, if, if someone raises their hand, do you know yeah. how to bring them on to this to this stage? Yeah, so if you click Q&A, yeah. and you'll see a raised hand, and I think if you click on the person, yeah, they will come up on the screen, okay. and they can unmute their mic and share their ca ca camera. Okay. Um, that's, I think that's, that's right, right, Sushi? Um, Shruti, sorry. Yeah, that's what I understood, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so that's how, it, yeah. So I guess what we will do instead of uh, breakout rooms is just do the feedback. Um, and I guess that will give us some minutes back in case we, we go over. Yeah. We'll break out. 
Yeah. Do you have the timing breakdown again? Handy yeah. Time? Do you, can you drop that maybe even just in our WhatsApp or something, if that's easy? Yeah. Cool. Just... I'll do that. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ashley. I was just dropping in to make sure all was well, and it looks like you're all here, which is fantastic. And any, um, so you'll have a social media moderator uh, that'll be funneling questions from the YouTube into your, um, oh, your nice. um, and you'll also have an in session moderator that'll be just watching the chat, um, helping questions if there is any, um, removing inappropriate posts. We've had very few of those, so. It's, it's a small thing. Um, and if so, something like technology goes awry, they'll be here to help and can flag our, our tech team. So uh, you'll have lots of support, but just wanted to pop in and say hello and thank you for being here and all those things. And uh, we're excited about your session. So um, yeah. 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 How's it? How's the summit been so far? How's it been? It's been good. Yeah. Um, a lot of really excited young people. Um, so I think that that's the, uh, the ultimate goal is that they're excited mm -hmm. and empowered. And I think that they are getting a lot of new great ideas that um, we'll see come to fruition uh, from this. So I think that's the, that's the best part of it all. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, they ask great questions. So be prepared for those. Um, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Wonderful, yeah. Um, Great. Ashley, just have, just a quick question. Yeah. Are we able to share our slides like as a link to to the people in the? Yeah. Okay. You can. Um, will you? Uh, do you have them in like a shareable format, like a Google Doc yeah. or something? Okay, cool. Um, will you just actually, if you want to drop them in the chat function, do you see the mod chat on the far yeah. right? So that chat is between you all and any moderators and me and the Juno team. So the participants can't see that. So mm -hmm. if you want to drop those in that chat right now, I can go ahead and prep the YouTube um, for for that as well. Great. But great idea. So perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. Y'all have a great session. Uh, you've got about 12 minutes. So that you've got a countdown clock on the right hand side over here. Um, next to all the I have emojis. Um, so once that counts down, you'll go. That's when you'll go live on YouTube, um, and your participants will be able to enter the room. So any last minute prep you'll want to wrap up before that countdown clock hits. Uh, it'll say live. So all right, have a yeah. great session. I'll be lurking in the background if you need anything, but I won't be on screen with you. So mm -hmm. thank you again, uh, and. Good luck. Thank you. Oh, she went off. Cool. Um, is there any, should we just quickly run through the slides again? Is that the best option? It's kind of, uh, kind of weird that I can't share, I can't see my screen as I'm sharing my sh the slides. This one. Um, cool. Can everyone see it full screen? Can you see us as you're sharing the slides? No, that's oh, the. It's, it's maximized. I think it's expanded. Can you see a button um, towards the bottom right? No. Obvious. You can't. Because okay. I can see an option to expand the slides and. And then I won't see everybody else, but I can also see an option to minimize it, and then I'll see everybody else. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, so yeah, first slide. Uh, I will do the intro. I will talk through today's aims. Um, share on you. You will lead the icebreaker. Um, have you got an icebreaker? Yeah, I'm basically just going to um, ask people to, in the chat, drop their names, their country, and 
about their country themselves. Cool. Uh, then we're going to spend five minutes each sharing our stories, connecting it to the topic at hand and the tasks that um, the things that we're going to cover. Um, how are people feeling about their stories? Haven't overly prepared it. I think we'll keep it fairly organic and yeah. brief. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then it's community mapping, and then what is a community map? Uh, I'll cover that, um, and then share. Then I'll talk about the task, and then Sharon will. Uh, I'll give them ten minutes to have a go at this um, with some pen and paper in their hand. Um, they draw it out, and then after ten minutes, Sharon, you can do a bit of feedback. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah, and then uh, Sharon, you can start the feedback. Um, okay. I will, I will time it, um, because I can't see anyone's faces to let me know that the time's up. Um, so I'll do we that. Was, we were saying earlier, Sharon, because we don't have breakouts, you so you could bring them on the stage and have some of them share their whole map really briefly. I mean, as long as they did it briefly, it could take ages if. So we'll have to be careful how we manage the time, but it could be quite interesting for all of us to see if you should be a bit brave. I imagine they might feel a bit shy the first one who goes first, but hopefully we can make it yeah, feel really um, How many minutes do we have for this session again? 15, right? Or five yeah. 15. So you have 15 minutes for feedback. Okay. Yeah, I think that'll be really interesting for them eh, to. And if it finishes earlier, we can always keep going. Like say, if, if they depends, I don't know. I don't know how chatty or shy they'll be. They might all just be really chatty. The other thing I was conscious of is if they're asking questions as we're explaining, we might need to allow time for that as well. So our timings say as you're explaining the exercise, and some questions come in, or even during our yeah, stories, yeah. if some questions come in, we just have to be mindful of kind of responding. I think for the time, we should just let maybe about three people share their feedback. Um, so we'd let them yes. know that we're just going three and then just so we might finish earlier to take your session and also to take questions as well. Questions yeah. at the end of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a good, good idea. Um, yeah, definitely. I think we will have some time back now that we don't do breakouts. Yeah. Um, which is great. Uh, so yeah, and then off to you, Shruti, to do the get impact gap canvassing. I'm just going to check all the slides are there. Um, uh, you might have to let me know when to like, move to the next slide because yeah, yeah, I can just prompt you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. All of these slides need to be in place. And then in terms of next steps, uh, Shayon, do you want to talk a little bit about peace first? Yeah. So yeah, I'm just Great. going to talk about peace first. How we started and what we do um, yeah. to help young people across any region that they actually are. So, yeah. And um, in case they have any questions, maybe as to who to reach out to. Okay, the the link to the website is there in the last slide, I guess. And I think yeah. our email addresses are also there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then also the, the links to our um, uh, social media is there too. Okay. And then Yashruti, you have some time to talk about Global yeah, shift. A minute will be sufficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. And then I'll, I, I can just be like, if you have any, if you want to find out further, here's the websites. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email us. And then we have time for questions. Yeah, perfect. And then do we have links to the, like, at the end, I think, I mean, I can always drop it in the chat box as well, the link to the Impact Gap canvas because I'd recommend them if they're keen to read the report and get the, oh, it's there, hey? Yeah, it's on that slide. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Um, cool. Great. We're all set. Any, any final challenges or questions? Yeah, good luck. So fun. <laughs> Yeah, good luck to you guys. Yeah. Cool. Um, 
And if I'm having any difficulty sharing, I will have to like verbally let you guys know. And then... Yeah, yeah. What was if in case we need to share? It's just that. Uh... How did you get into share screen? Just so we're aware in case. Uh, share desktop is right next to the microphone. Ah, uh, yeah, perfect. And I'll just pull up the slides as well, just in case. Yeah, if you can pull up the slides, that'll be perfect. Um, and if we're proper, proper experiencing any problems, share on if we if you see the mod tab, you can basically uh, chat with the with the moderators who are currently us right now i'm just gonna top up my water and be back in two six yeah cool okay just to confirm so we might we might have to be the ones to share the slides when it gets our turn you would you wouldn't be able to do that for us right is that why she was asking if we could also share no just in case i have problems so i'm going to share the slides the whole way through um but i won't be able to see you guys when I'm sharing my slides. So if I have a problem, I'll just let you guys know. Okay. And then you guys can, one of you guys can share the slides. And then if we have like any like problems, we should click the mod tab and then just type our questions on the mod tab. Okay. Um, so that, that's the bit where only we can see basically. Okay. Um, great. Um, I'm excited for this. <laughs> That's a hundred people apparently that are signed up, so it's going to be a huge number. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people want to sign up for this social entrepreneurship. Yeah, because it's a very reasonable topic. Yeah, and we might get a, a a flurry of peace first projects as a result too. Exactly, and I'm actually looking forward to seeing projects from other regions besides Sub-Saharan. <laughs> I wonder who's the audience. Like, I wonder how many people from each region are in the audience today. Yeah. I don't know if we'll ever find out, but yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll find out during the ice break. Yeah, that's a good point. What time is it over in New Zealand, Shruti? Just on 10 p.m. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, the earlier time was a bit better, but no stress. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I completely didn't know that, like, British summertime doesn't mean GMT. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they, yeah, like, a, just a minor bit of feedback of, you could use UTC, like, universally coordinated time, if you want something really yeah. neutral, or, like, yeah, like not GMT when it's summer at least. Like it makes more sense right. to use EST at this time. That's yeah. right. Yeah, I never knew that. <laughs> well, that's a definite sign that Britain always. I used a time. I used a time zone converter, and it said GMT slash BST, but then it just shows BST now. Like it doesn't show GMT time because only in the winter it comes up. Is that so? Yeah. Which is so weird, like <laughs> so weird. Okay. So I'm guessing people will start joining in as soon as it hits eleven. Should we get started right away? I guess. Yeah, I think so. 
And the beginning is interest stuff anyway. So. Yeah. Right, <laughs> I was really confused there. Um, great, let's let's get started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all that are joining. Um, my name's Hamid. I am the program manager for Peace First in uh, the UK and Europe, uh, and I'm joined by my colleagues Sharon and Shruti, who will give a proper in-depth um, introduction in a minute. Um, uh, welcome to the social entrepreneurship session. Um, we will cover uh, a number of topics today, um, and these topics are essentially um, help to help you ground yourself in your community and the issue at hand. Um, so it's great for beginners who are just beginning their social entrepreneurship journey. Uh, and it's also great for veterans and experienced individuals who want to get a refresher and re-center themselves in the community that they represent uh, and, and the issue that they're, that they're tackling at hand. So thank you all for joining. Um, so today, just to let you know, we're, the agenda that we're going to cover is a bit of storytelling. Mm -hmm. So each of us are going to introduce ourselves and share our story of uh, social action and social entrepreneurship and social justice um, and then we're going to cover a topic called community mapping and do a community mapping exercise something that we run at Peace First and, and the projects that uh, come onto our platform do. Um, then Shruti who is from the Global Shapers is going to discuss Impact Gap Canvas uh, and that tool and how you can use it and then we're going to talk about next steps, um, uh, a few resources that you can use, and then have some space for question and answer. Um, so just to cover today's aims, so storytelling, um, the reason why we're doing this is to, to, to help you understand how and why we do the work that we do, um, and to ground you in the topic at hand uh, and what we're about to discuss and why it's connected to um, individual journeys of social action. Um, two, we're going to discuss community mapping, as, as, as mentioned previously, and that's to give you a clearer understanding of your community, um, what, what its needs are and what shapes it. And then in terms of the impact gap canvas, um, you're going to understand the problem you, that you wish to address in a much deeper form and how your solution can maximise your impact. Um, Brilliant. So just uh, uh, an icebreaker. Sheon, do you want to lead us into our icebreaker? Sure. Hamid, everyone, I'm very happy and very happy to see you join this session um, from Water Up Country. My name is Sheon, and I work with Hamid at Peace First as the Regional Manager for Sub-Saharan Africa. And I also have my colleague with me on this call. So for the icebreaker, I'd like to get to know you. And so um, use the chat box and tell us, tell us the country that you're coming from and also tell us one thing that you deeply love about your country. So I'll start. My name is Shion. I'm calling from Nigeria. And if there's anything that I love about my country, it would be um, the food. I think that we have good food in Nigeria. So we really like to hear from you as well. So represent your country. I can see. Um, Ghana, I can see um, someone calling in from South Korea. So use the chat box and tell us your name um, and also the country you're calling from and then something that you really love about your country. So while we're waiting, um, Tammy, do you want to go? Tell us your name. Yeah. As already, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I'm Tamid. I'm from London, United Kingdom. Um, what do I love about... The thing about being from London is you, you feel like it's separate from the rest of the UK. Um, so I'm just going to talk about London. Um, London, I love how multicultural the city is, um, the different cultures, particularly the music of the city. 
Um, I'm a big music fan, and there's so much diverse music in London. Um, Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And I can see folks already sharing um, things they love about their country, um, Tanzania, the culture, Sophia from Hong, um, yes, Hong Kong. And then we have folks joining us from Indonesia, from the UK. Yes, keep it coming. Um, Trucy, do you want to tell us your country and what you love about it? But hey, welcome everyone to the session. I'm Shruti. Um, it's even challenging the question, what's your country? Because like many of you, I, I identify with many. I'm based here in New Zealand and I love the nature. It's stunning. I'm also really connected to India where my family is from and I love the food and the culture, especially the food is grandmother's like home prepared food that just spoils you, nothing quite like it. So um, some things I love about the countries I come from. Awesome. And it's really good to see folks joining us from Asia, from Sub-Saharan Africa, and from different regions across the world, from Europe, from the US. Thank you all so much for joining. And keep it coming. Tell us your country. Um, let everyone on this call see where you're from and let them also get to see one thing that you love about your country. I'm going to pass it back to Tammy now while um, you can continue putting it in the chat, what you love about your country. Brilliant. So uh, now what we're going to do is uh, share a bit of introduction uh, about each of us um, as facilitators. Um, I am going to invite Shayon to go first um, and then Shruti and then I can go last. Um, yeah, go for it. Sure. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Shayon. I am from Nigeria and I currently live in Lagos. Um, I guess that my social entrepreneurship journey started in 2016. I had just finished from the university and I had some extra clothes and food stuff that I didn't want to take back to my community where I lived. So I just wanted to give it out to an orphanage. And so I'd gone visiting that orphanage with a friend and while we were there and while the administrator was speaking to us and telling us about their needs, I noticed that there were like a lot of flies coming and overing and just fetching and it was so uncomfortable. But it seemed like the only people who were uncomfortable were myself and my friend. Every other person, the children who lived there, the admin, every other person seemed like they were okay, like that was their lifestyle. And I I saw that the nets were torn, I looked at the doors, I saw that the nets were torn, and I knew then that the needs that these people had was beyond food stuff. They actually needed other things as well. And I think that experience shaped me, and that experience birthed my um, journey into trying to contribute to improving the lives of people um, around the world. I, I started this in my own local community. I started reaching out to young people. Um, I started introducing social learning into school curriculums, um, just so that young people could be empowered to make um, informed decisions and they could move from becoming victims to becoming value-adding individuals in society. But then in August of 2020, I joined Peace First, and that basically took my work from a community level to a global front. I remember that all the years that I spent building my peacemaking work was basically um, brought up to a global front, and I started to interact with so many young people, hundreds of young people, across different countries in sub-Saharan Africa who had the intention to create social change in their community as well. I would coach them, I would support them, and sometimes with funding. And I've been doing that since August, um, contributing my expertise and contributing my experiences. And I'm here today representing Peace First um, in order to also contribute some of those expertise and experience into this session. So I really look forward to um, the rest of this session and I'll be passing it on to Shruti to tell our story and also introduce herself. Thank you so much, Sharon. Lovely to um, hear bits of your story. Um, so as mentioned, you know, I, I come from both India and New Zealand in many ways. I think my, my journey with social change began as a child traveling between these two countries, living in New Zealand and then going home to the madness and the beauty and the wonder and the chaos of India. And seeing this one country that has such extreme poverty and pollution and then coming back to New Zealand where, of course, we have poverty, but nothing like the scale of India had me questioning privilege and justice. And why do I have the resources I have? Why is my country so wealthy? But what about colonization and all these big issues that have sort of led to us 
um, having the sort of wealth and issues and, and state of the society that we're in. And, and that really sparked this kind of urge or this responsibility really to want to serve or want to, you know, there was a sense I used to feel often of if people are living in poverty, how would they feel about me just living my like privileged life here, not even thinking about them, you know, like a real sense of sisterhood, brotherhood to people everywhere. What also happened was the more I started learning about these issues, I realized whenever I learned about any issue, I got passionate about it. So initially, a lot of my activism was in the sort of poverty eradication space, helping young people fundraise and go and volunteer and, and see the impact of their money in, in developing countries. I got passionate about the environment and some friends and I built some kayaks out of plastic bottles and waste materials and took people on adventures around parts of New Zealand to learn about plastic pollution. I learned about education inequality, went back to India to work with an education nonprofit. And, you know, people used to often say, like, find your cause and like be committed to it. But I realized, like, I didn't have a cause, you know, any cause, <laughs> if I learned enough about it, touched my heart. And I didn't like this idea of choose your thing or find your thing. I think in my and some in some cases, people really have some single issue that speaks to them. But for me, it was more just this desire to see a more harmonious, flourishing society for all life. And so I think in this pursuit and question of what does it mean to contribute and what's my place, um, I studied economics and political science and they felt like two big systems kind of vague. I didn't even know what economics or politics really was going into university, but it felt like understanding these things might help me better understand the world and why things are the way they are. And in the study of economics and politics both, but especially economics, I really um, realized just how powerful business is and how so much power in the world often sits with corporates. Many corporations actually fund our governments and lobby for the policies and and business is often driven by the system that's all about maximizing profit. You know, we want to maximize shareholder value, profits, bottom line. And, and this pursuit of profit, I began to realize, leads to us exploiting the environment, exploiting people, not paying people well, huge inequality, people getting, you know, earning wages 20 times, you know, CEOs earning 20, 30, 50 times that of you know, the, the people actually making the products, all kinds of issues that I realized came out of this profit chase. And and often in economics, we, we're taught in Econ 101 in many parts of the world, this kind of Western approach that humans exist to maximize self-interest. And if we go and make as much money as we can for ourselves and compete for scarce resources, we'll, we'll be well off. And, and this sort of mindset made no sense. And I'm like, oh, but I like to care and I like to help people. And I don't think we all just run on self-interest. I think there's a different way of thinking about economics and business. And that really sparked this passion to want to see how business, this powerful vehicle, could be used as a force for social change. And that's when I discovered social entrepreneurship. Initially, I was a consultant in a, in a big consulting firm. Often these are the bad guys kind of helping the big companies make more money, but it was useful learning. And I realized hanging around the sort of business leaders who I'm trying to influence <laughs> and shift even today, you know, it was necessary to kind of learn and be a part of, of the dark side, <laughs> you could say. Um, and then I spent some time yeah, working for social um, enterprises and education and then running a social enterprise accelerator, helping young people start and grow their own social businesses. And there was a lot of value in kind of exploring business and social good from different points, from the corporation side, from the nonprofit side, as a coach trying to help people. Um, and I've come to appreciate, you know, in navigating impact careers, being in different parts of the ecosystem is so critical and something we'll explore further with the impact gap canvas. But all in all, um, ended up doing some more study. And I think there's never enough we can learn about the problems we care about. So when I did a master's over in the UK to really explore capitalism more deeply. And today I'm based in New Zealand. A lot of my work is coaching leaders and supporting businesses to do business in a way that puts well-being at its core. Um, you know, with a set of values that are much more aligned with indigenous values here in New Zealand, with the values in a lot of our cultures that really, yeah, how do we distribute profits? How do we pay people? How do we treat the environment? How do we do things in a way that really serves the collective good. So a little bit about my journey and really grateful to share this time with you all today. And with that, over to you, Tamin. Thank you all for sharing such great stories. Um, yeah, so I, as, as I mentioned previously, I grew up in London. I've lived there my whole life. I'm 26 years old. I spent 26 years in London. I have not moved, um, although moving to America soon. Um, and as I mentioned before, London is a really multicultural city um, and there's so many diverse cultures that inhabit this huge space of around nine million people. 
Um, and growing up, you experience it quite a lot and you see it quite a lot. But at the same time, you see the disparity in London. Um, often you see huge buildings um, um, with great big glass windows and, and lots of banks sitting in, in those win uh, windows. And um, just beyond those big buildings, you have housing estates where loads of people live in poverty who experience um, various forms of discrimination. Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting sight to see. When you think of London, you always think of multicultural city, tea sippers, all of this stuff. Um, but you often don't see or understand the inequality. And, and, and I experienced that from a really young age um, and seeing that from a really young age. And often my identity um, often was, was put, on, uh, put on show for people and often experienced various different um, issues in relation to that, whether it be related to the police, whether it be access to better education, um, whether it be um, access to proper housing. Uh, uh, and a lot of people mm -hmm. who I grew up with experienced those very same issues. Um, and I became really curious about those issues. I went on to study politics at university, economics and politics, so um, and I uh, experienced a, a weird kind of sense of like, I, I'm studying about all these great philosophers from France and the UK in the 17th and 18th century, but they don't really understand what it's like to live the life of a Londoner in, in the 21st century in 2021. And so I kind of embarked on an experience where I was like, oh, I need to kind of find out how we can actually change the world and not think about these philosophers and how can we center change amongst community uh, and in and amongst community. And so uh, I spent a great deal of time uh, learning about community organizing, which is centered about centered around the people uh, and the people on the ground and the teachers and the moms and the uh, pastors and the students and the uh, and, and all the people who occupy the community on the ground level. And and uh, from that, I came to understand where, how you tackle and challenge issues in, in the right sort of way. Um, uh, as I mentioned, London is a very multicultural city and it has various different um, cultures and lots and lots of migrants and refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, and during uh, the Syrian refugee crisis, um, the, the the papers in London uh, were and in the across the UK were were, were sharing horrendous articles about um, people of different cultures, people from different backgrounds. And uh, I got a group of young people together um, whilst working as a community organising volunteer to start up a campaign called Stand Up, Stand Out. And, and essentially the campaign was to address these issues um, that people were experiencing on the ground as a result of the way that the papers were portraying migrants in the media. And um, from there, uh, we, we led a really successful campaign um, that stopped a whole bunch of advertisers from advertising in these hate, uh, papers who shared hateful articles um, and was really successful. And one of the, the key things that we did was challenge the London mayor to install a department for citizenship and integration. Um, and he managed to do that um, with, with flying success. And it helps hundreds of thousands of, uh, of pe uh, people have access, better access and better information to, to their citizenship rights um, and feel like a more inclusive city. And, and the reason why I share this story is, is because uh, I really think about my journey as being really grounded in community um, and the success of our campaign was really grounding in understanding what our community's wants and needs were. Um, so just to, just to share a little bit, tiny little bit more about my story, I moved on to become a community organiser, worked in the northwest of London, um, worked in various young people led campaigns, school children who were uh, trying to stop muggings on streets to national campaigns around citizenship access. And then now I work for Peace First and doing a very similar role to Sheon, um, uh, in working in UK and Europe, um, trying to get young people to start projects and social action. Um, so yeah, that is our stories. Um,
I'm going to reshare our screen for you. And just a reminder for those who um, for those who need some support, there is a fan screen option on the bottom right of the uh, of the shared screen, so you can see it for um, on your screen. So um, what we're going to do now is a bit of an exercise. Um, before we get to it, you're going to need a, f a couple of resources. So if you have uh, pen and paper at hand, that will be uh, brilliant and amazing. And if you have uh, colours, coloured pens or pencils, that will be even better. So I'll just give you guys about 30 seconds to kind of gather your resources um, before we start the session. Um, but just to give you a bit of a, a, an intro into what the session is going to be, um, it's an exercise that we use at Peace First. Before anyone creates any form of project, they do this exercise. Um, and this exercise is called community mapping. And essentially, it's a visualization exercise. Um, it is an exercise to help us understand what our community looks like um, from, from the physical spaces where people congregate to the key decision makers to the people who can help change the community to the bigger issues and the hopes and the dreams for the community um, and so what we what we tend to do before we before any young person even starts a project at peace first is they visualize their community using community map and this could look like um, the picture that's depicted on the screen here or it could be any shape or form that you want to make it. You could make it a list. Um, it could look at. It could look like a graph. Um, it could be a PowerPoint. Um, it could be however you want it to be. But essentially, it's a visualization of your community at large. Um, the other key thing about a community map is it helps us to determine who the key players are in our communities. So. When you're designing your community map and you're creating your community map, you're you're thinking about who are the decision makers, who has power, who are the helpers, essentially the people who are connected to other people who can shape and move and shift the issue that you're trying to address at hand. Um, and it also um, provides us an, in, uh, uh, an insight into issues as well. It helps us kind of think about, oh, like, this issue whilst we're visualizing the community helps us figure out like oh this issue exists in in our community um, and then the final thing that uh, a community map does is it provides us with an insight of what resources um we have at hand in the community or the lack layer of um, resources in the community um okay so hopefully you've all got pen and paper at hand um uh, and for those creatives, you've got your coloured pencils and your coloured pens. So what we're going to do now is we're going to spend the next 12 minutes um, creating our community map. And what I want you to do, as I said, you can visualise it in whatever way, shape or form that you want to do it. It could be a, a really cool map drawing. It could be a graph. It could be a list. Um, you could even pull up PowerPoint and, 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 and create some slides on it. But what I'd love for you to do is um, create your community map. So think about the places you visit, um, where you buy food or get water, where are the community centers, where are the schools, where are the places of worship, where are the places where people gather? Um, and then answer this spe these specific questions. Um, and as we have 12 minutes and we normally give you uh, at least half an hour to do this community map, what I'd like you to do is try and focus on the top three questions and then think about the, the next three questions in your own time. Hopefully you can kind of take your community map and then uh, take it offline and answer those, those final three questions. And so uh, the questions I'd like you to answer um, and focus on is what do you love and appreciate uh, about your community? Who are the helpers in your community? And just to reiterate, what I mean by helpers are uh, is the people who, in the community who can help move and shift around particular issues, who can help you in your time of need, who might have access to uh, loads and loads of people when you need the change. Uh, and then the, the, the next question, draw out who has power in your community. 
So the people who make the decisions in your community, the people who can uh, make things happen in your community, um, the leaders in your com um, the leaders in terms of the people who are following in your community. And then the other three questions that uh, you can get started on, but um, would love for you to take offline because they're a lot more, uh, they have a lot more depth to them. Draw out the problems in your community. Uh, what stands in the way of change in your community? What resources does your community have? Um, when, you think, when you think about resources, think about people, uh, think about information, think about uh, even monetary resources, um, and maybe even think about policy-wise, what kind of resources. And then the final question is, draw your hopes for your community. So it's a really important question. Really think about, what do I want my community look to look like um, in the future? Um, maybe the immediate term, maybe the long term. What do I, what do I want to see happen? What change do I want to experience? What does the, what does my ideal community look like? So uh, I'm going to give you guys until 11:35 uh, um, to complete this task. Sorry, 11:30. Uh, we'll go into 11:38 uh, um, to complete this task, and then we're going to uh, spend some time. Um, uh, feeding back. Um, so off you go uh, and then I'll let you know when the time is done and then uh, Sharon will lead the feedback. And I'll keep the, the screen uh, shared so you, so you have access to um, the questions. Uh, just a bit of a disclaimer as well. Um, I said 11.38, I'm referring to British summertime. So 10.38 GMT um, would be the time when we're, we're finished. But essentially, you've got roughly 10 minutes. I just wanted to use this time to share that if anyone has any questions, maybe something is not clear, um, you could put it in the Q&A for us so that Tamit could um, explain um, as you go about to draw your community map. Yeah, thanks for that, Sean.
Just to let you all know, you have roughly about five minutes left.
Just a couple more minutes. All right, um, gr brilliant. If you could just finish up what you're writing or drawing, and then I will hand it over to Sheon to lead us into the feedback. Thank you so much, Tammy. And I hope that you guys enjoyed um, the exercise. As Tammy has mentioned, one of the reasons why we're doing this is because we know that as social entrepreneurs, you would be um, solving lots of problems in your community and it's important that you understand or you visualize or you know your community like in and out and that's why we've done this exercise and so we are going to be inviting about three of you to join us on stage and to share with us um, what you have drawn or what you have mapped out in this exercise and so if you would like to share we implore you to share so if you'd like to share your community map with the rest of the um, audience, signify by raising your hand and we would be able to um, um, bring you up on stage. So just signify by raising your hand and we'd be able to bring you up on stage. You could use, when you go to Q&A, you'd see a raise hand function. You just signify by raising your hand and we'll bring you up on stage. So while we're waiting, I just wanted to share what I drew out in my community map really quickly. Um, you know, I live or lived for the most part of my life in Otago State, which is a rural, rural community here in Nigeria. And um, my community is made up of individuals, young and old, who, of course, their houses. Um, and we, it's, a, it's sort of like a site, what we call sites in Nigeria, it refers to land, like a vast land that doesn't really belong to the government. And so individuals actually get to buy their own land and they get to build their own houses. But majority of people that live in my community, their houses, they rented those houses and they live there. And then we have people who are carving out small stores to sell things just outside of their houses. We have markets, we have places of worship, we have recreational stores. And so I, when Tamid was leading us through that exercise, I could visualize all of these different places. And when we were asked to share, I'm just going to focus on the first three questions there about um, what exactly does my community have? We have a good school system, actually, most of them public. Um, I, one thing I love about my community, again, is the communalism. So usually when someone in the community is doing something, you find that every other person in the community also wants to join them as well. So. If you would like to share again, just raise your hand and I'll call you up on stage. Um, we also, I also love the fact that, or another thing that we have are community leaders and a lot of youths in my community. However, despite all of these things, we also have a lot of problems as well. And I think that the leading problem we have in my community is poverty. People are very poor and we have so many people that are living below the um, baseline new standard a lot of people and then there's also a lot of violence and thuggery and so you have high school dropouts and you have a lot of people who are getting pregnant as teenagers and there's also a lack of positive models and influencing but when we when we talk about resources that the community has we have a lot of human resources we have technology access to technology 
we have access to schools and we have organizations, non-governmental and private, who are actually doing good work in my community. And so um, if you're interested and would like to share your feedback, kindly raise your hand and we'd like to invite you to the stage to share your community map with the rest of you. I'm not sure if we are um, being shy. Uh, I believe that we had done this exercise and I know that we've drawn some things on our paper. And it would be really cool to share with the audience, everyone who is watching at this session live on Juno or even on YouTube to see what you've done, what you've drawn. And it would give us an inkling into the kind of community that you currently live or you come from. So kindly share. Um, yeah, and as Tracy just added, you're welcome to share your reflections from the map in the chat box as well. Um, and so while we're waiting, Tammy, do we still have some minutes to just wait for folks to signify their interest? Yeah, so we still got a few minutes um, to share feedback. So please do share some feedback. And maybe just a, a question, just a simple question to ask. What, what was interesting um, when you... With that, what's something interesting that you found when you were drawing out your community map? Maybe drop it in the chat. I see everyone is very shy today. I'm happy to share some reflections if you like, Sean, um, as we wait for people to share their thoughts. I drew a, I drew a little map, a quick map, just on my very local community, so like my suburb which is just, you know, maybe a 150 meter radius or a bit more than that, maybe two, 200 meter radius from where I live. Um, what I found really interesting was just acknowledging that there are many beautiful green spaces and also community spaces that we have, but I don't know how much they're utilized across groups. We've got community associations and, you know, different ethnic groups have associations. There's maybe sports clubs, but how much kind of intersection happens between the groups, I'm not so sure. So we've got connectivity but it can feel a bit siloed at times it was really interesting to acknowledge whilst we all live in such a close space there's a lot of disconnection and loneliness in our community as well and there's lots of opportunities to connect in spaces we could utilize and yet many people don't have access to them may not feel comfortable using them so I really it was interesting to look at what's available the opportunities there's actually quite a lot of opportunity and resource um, and yet there's issues like loneliness disconnection um, to some extent also violence and crime that could be, you know, it feels like there's something that could be done um, to address those issues given what's in our community. So those are some initial reflections. I found it really valuable. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, Shruti. And, you know, as you were speaking, it was interesting the things you pointed out. And I was remembering how I could have also actually noted some of those things as well. It's funny how we overlook some things that are just right in front of our eyes. Um, in our community on a day-to-day -day basis. But thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Julia says in the chat that it was interesting um, when she was drawing our community map to discover that our community has a lot of helpers. And um, we says, I consider my community to be my town. And when compared to other parts of the country, we are doing well, although there are still some issues that need to be addressed. So that's, that's very interesting to note. Um, again, if you would like to join on stage to just share your thought, I think we can take one person now um, to just share your share your thoughts and also share what's interesting about your community or what you drew in your map. It would be nice to just signify, but thank you. And you can also keep putting it in the chat what was interesting about your community. So while we're waiting, Tamit, do you want to share what was interesting about your community map? Yeah, um, just 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 wanted to share a little uh, story about a couple of helpers and who might be your helpers and who uh, you never know could be your helpers. Um, so I, I did a I did a, a lot of work as a community organizer in schools, and um, the head teacher was a very influential person, and he would probably be someone that we'd ha would say as someone who has power, but. When it comes to him sorting out issues in the school, he didn't have very much time. Um, and so the real helper of that community 
was essentially the assistant head teacher. Her name was Susan Grace, um, and she basically made all the things happen in the school. Um, and she was the person in 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 the background who 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 was always there to kind of make sure all the students are working. And whenever the when we when we started the campaign, um, we started a campaign on getting light, lights up in the local park. And when we started the campaign, um, when we asked the head teacher to to bring in the local community, the first thing that the head teacher mentioned, um, and the head teacher was Danny, was go to Susan Grace. Susan Grace knows the whole community. Um, Susan Grace will grab all of the all of the residents in the community, the two local schools and the, and the um, sports centre just down the road as well. Uh, and she will be your person to bring those people. So just a, a bit of a, a story on, on who your helpers might be. And something else to just add as well. Um, this is, I think it's really important to really connect your community map to the challenge that you want to address, um, the action you wish to take, um, particularly in and around um, finding and identifying how you can make that change happen. Um, I, I see there's loads of feedback, so sure. Yeah, so I was just going to read some of the feedback that we got in the comments. Um, I have one here from Sophia who says, I made a mind map of sorts. I split my community into three categories, my school, Hong Kong Girls Guide Association, my residential area, and my district. I also put down some points on Hong Kong in general. It would really be nice to hear about them, Sophia. And then we have Nicole. She is not really doing well at the moment, um, especially when it comes to the youth. Today inspired me to stand up and look for like-minded people so that we sensitize other young people on these negative things that are happening. That's really brilliant, Nicole. I'm so happy that you've been inspired and you're looking at how to collaborate with other young people in your community to create some change. Then Prince says, my name is Prince from Ghana. Hi, Prince, Akwaba. Um, currently living in a community called Red Dompona. I love the atmosphere and the people. There are a lot of youths and less elder people living here. However, there are lots of problems in my communities, like bad roads and difficulty to get access to water. Um, it's so good that you guys have been able to map out your community. I'm happy to see that you actually took the exercise and we, we, we're happy, you're welcome to keep sharing your feedback as we continue in the session. So thank you all so much for sharing. Let me see, did I miss any, um, any comment? Okay, yeah, there's someone from Taiwan, Chen, he says, um, I consider my community is full of youth leaders and they empower each other. We can try to achieve, they can try to achieve their goals without gender, social status, limitations. Although people might have different ideas with social issues, they're allowed to speak up and try to cooperate with others. Certainly there'll be lots of trees and people also are eco-friendly. That's nice. That's very nice. And Prince has identified a lot of wealthy people in your community who can help. So I'm happy to see that we actually got a grasp of the community map. And going forward in our in our work, um, let's continue to use this exercise to actually visualize our communities um, in order to identify resources that could actually help us further. So um, I think that's all the feedback we've got for now. Back to you, Cami. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, some really great insights um, in terms of your community maps. Uh, as I mentioned, do take this further, answer those final three questions and think about when you start your social action project, maybe start your social entrepreneurship journey, root it in your community. Think about how um, your community map can help you design that campaign, that project, um, that action that you really wanna create. Um, think about those people in power, think about those decision makers, think about those helpers, those Susan Graces that in your community, those uh, community hubs, those young people, um, and I, as I as I see, lots of people really engage really well with the with the community um, maps and uh, are really getting a better understanding. or probably already have a great understanding of the community. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go into a little break. Um, we'll we'll give you guys about ten minutes to just uh, stretch, grab some water, maybe take your eyes off the screen for for a little bit. Um, and then we'll come back together in, in 10 minutes time. Um, again, just to reiterate, that will be 11 a.m. GMT um, for, for those that need uh, a, a, an understanding of the time. Um, brilliant. So uh, 
10 minutes for those who are watching on YouTube and, uh, and those who are joined, 10 minutes.
hopefully people will start coming back in. Just give it another minute. Um, just something to reiterate that Sheon mentioned earlier as well. If, if at any time you do have any questions, just drop it in the Q&A and we'll, we'll um, try and answer it as best as possible. Great. Um, great. Hopefully everyone is back and they're feeling a little bit rested. Went for a few stretches, got got some water um, to start our next session, next section, which is led by Shruti. I'm just going to share my screen. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Tamid, and welcome back, everyone. Hopefully you're feeling a bit more connected and grounded to your community after that fantastic exercise. And this next section will really help us build on our community map and get a better sense of how we can navigate the problems that we care about, the things we're really passionate about, and ensure that the projects we start, the social businesses we start, the efforts we have, you know, in our community, whether as activists or entrepreneurs, however we do, can really have the maximum positive impact and minimize any negative consequences, um, really, so you can serve your communities in the best way possible. So this will be a, a tool um, and a kind of set of principles to really support you, um, hopefully in a very practical way. I also wanted to acknowledge before we go any further, there's an amazing woman, Daniela Pepe Thornton, who did um, a bunch of research that led to the development of this canvas. So really acknowledge her work and all the people that have enabled this to be developed by her. We'll share a link later on to uh, her full report and, and you'll be able to kind of dig more into the thinking that exists under this little intro that we're gonna give you today. So if we jump to the next slide, Tamid, as mentioned, good intentions are not enough. And as kind of change makers and change agents, I'm sure all of us here have beautiful intentions for a more flourishing you know, society in all ways. That question time had is beautiful, you know? What hopes do you have for your community and be it around peace or domestic violence or the environment? We all have many hopes, but the reality is sometimes um, not so good consequences happen because um, yeah, we're not quite aware of what we're getting ourselves into. If we go to the next slide, um, this is a fairly well-known um, social enterprise. Some of you, many of you may have heard of them, they're called Tom's Shoes. And basically they've got this model where you buy a pair of these shoes, they're inspired by Argentine shoes actually. And for every pair of shoes you buy, one pair of shoes is donated to a child who doesn't have shoes in a developing country. And that was the model. And the shoes were sold largely um, in the US and more of the Western markets. And, you know, a pair of shoes would be bought for someone in a community where they don't have access to, to shoes. So we'd love to invite you just to take a moment and reflect what might be problematic about this approach. The best of intentions, you know, we want to help kids have shoes. We want to make a great business. We want to make money and do good. Any thoughts on what might be problematic about this approach? And, yeah, just feel free to take a second to think about it and drop any reflections in the chat box um, as they arise. Some of us, I mean, the, yeah, the other thing I want to acknowledge is we can point out a few of the criticisms. The, the company's been very open to a lot of these criticisms and evolved their model quite a bit. So even if you do start a venture and you notice, oh, there might be some unintended negative consequences, you can really learn, adapt, and evolve. Feels like a, a bit of a shy event, so hopefully your, your mind is ticking. I'll share, you, I'll share with you a few thoughts and feel free to add more thoughts if, if any arise. Um, one major issue is you think about it's it's a this kind of model is often criticized by a lot of people shoe size okay got a couple ah i've got some great thoughts coming in so we'll come back to those in the chat box shortly um ah, julia nailed it so white saverism this is one issue so often we have people in the west that have a bit more wealth and we go to these poor countries and think we know what they need without actually talking to our community, without actually asking them, without actually giving them the tools they need to empower themselves. So, so often there's a disconnect between, you know, it's more about me feeling good about helping someone than actually finding out what they need. What happened in this case, as they started giving shoes, local shoe manufacturers were put out of jobs. People that made money providing shoes to the community, they, they were losing their jobs and losing their livelihoods, which was really not ideal. 
what we found was children often didn't even need or want these shoes. You know, there were more bigger pressing issues in their community, even just having access to schools, having access to books. So it wasn't actually solving the root issues that these community need, needed to kind of um, develop themselves as well. We've had a few um, more thoughts come in through the chat box. It's based on consumerism, potentially creates more distance between the privileged and the privileged. Absolutely. So for this model to grow, we have to consume more stuff, right, which has an environmental cost. And the only way they can scale their impact is if we consume and buy more and more things, which inherently is not sustainable. Um, it's a help for those in need. It's not focused on solving the issues exactly. It's not getting to the core root issues, as you've said, Maria, beautiful. Um, it's similar to volunteerism. Yeah, fantastic. It feeds into a cycle of depending on Western money but rather than the money staying in the community. Amazing. A really, really rich comment. So you can see it's a good intention. There's a way to do this that could address a lot of our issues rather than coming in with the solutions. If we can talk to the community, meet with them, think about, yeah, what they need, work with them, share power. There's many, many issues. I mean, there's even a broader ethical question of who should be going into which communities and, and what are people's roles. So it's really complex, I think, is the takeaway. And we need to be wary that sometimes we can have the best of intentions but not realize the complexity and even the best of us. Yeah, good point, May. Huge environmental impact even when the shoes get thrown away. So if we jump into the next slide, another solution that we are seeing from many car companies is look, if we have fuel efficient cars, this is a great solution because cars don't need as much fuel. And so we can save fuel, um, which in theory should be a really good thing environmentally, right? You can save fuel, save fossil fuels, good environmental impact, less emissions. What are some of the problems? What might be problematic with this sort of solution? So just take a moment to think about it. It's a pretty, um, yeah, it's a pretty big um, issue generally today, you know, just transportation, carbon emissions, a lot of pressure on businesses to find more sustainable ways to um, do transportation. So, yeah, just when you're ready, drop your thoughts in the chat box. Such a rich sharing we had for the last prompt. So I know there's some wonderful critical thinkers here. May says electric cars are extremely expensive. So this is not an electric car. So this is a normal, a normal kind of petrol car, but say, say originally, you know, a car would travel 100 kilometers on a few liters. This would travel, say, 150 kilometers on a few liters. So it, the fuel kind of goes further. So Lester says some are greenwashing. We'll come back to this. Regarding the last bit, when homeless shelters only receive soup, so this is about the previous one, we'll come back to that. A lot of people cannot buy these vehicles, therefore they can become elitarian similar to the point earlier around electric vehicles being expensive so yeah very good points the kind of core issue that's really problematic here is when i mean in theory it makes sense if people have cars it's not a root cause solution but surely they need less fuel it's a good idea but what um when studies were done what was discovered is when people's cars are more fuel efficient they tend to drive more and they think they tend to realize oh, i don't spend as much money on petrol so let me go on longer road trips or trips that may have been taken on train or by plane, they start driving. In planes, probably it's still better <laughs> than plane to drive, but on net, the fuel consumption increased significantly. So people are actually using more fuel um, because of the psychology of a fuel efficient car. So it really didn't have even the basic impact it intended to have. More than that, it's not a root cause solution. You know, If we want more sustainable transport, we need to at least consider, I mean, electrification is a good step, but as many of you have said, it's not always affordable. It can become elitarian. What, what really perhaps is needed is just a more sustainable public transport system. Again, it's not always possible. Easier in cities, harder in rural areas. So there's a lot of complexity, and this goes back to the importance of knowing your community and what works. But the idea of a fuel-efficient car or even an electric car to solve the complex environmental issues around um transport emissions isn't quite sufficient and particularly at least in cities you know public transport and green public transport perhaps electric buses electric trains is really uh, more of the solutions that we need perhaps even more local communities where people don't have to travel as much how do we reduce the need for travel and build stronger local communities where people aren't having to move as much we've had a few more um lovely comments come through yeah more money in public transport need more places to build electric stations totally Electricity can also come from unsustainable sources, spot on. So again, as you can see, many problems. Again, you might have a good intention as a product designer or an engineer in one of these big firms saying, I want to save fuel. 
but if you're not really critical and if you don't really embrace the complexity and again the local community it can lead to not so ideal consequences so hopefully that just gives us a bit of caution and reminds us we need to really be careful before we do any kind of social project and not jump in we might think oh, i really know this well i've been in the industry for so long you've got the best engineer that's been making cars his whole life but still you know we all have blind spots and it requires some humility to realize i can't see the full picture and i need to talk to others and get their support as well so if we jump into the next slide so why do things go wrong and I invite you again to share your thoughts in the chat box why is it that people with these amazing intentions you know really not always amazing intentions sometimes it's greenwashing as someone said earlier um sometimes we just want to make some money because people want sustainable products so perhaps the intentions aren't always pure but in in this group you know where we are really inspired to serve our communities why is it that things sometimes go wrong and I invite you to share your thoughts in the chat box and yeah acknowledge more of the comments that have come through sophia pollution caused is a bit of an issue as well um lo lovely comments so love you to reflect on why do things go wrong i'll share a few thoughts if we go to the next slide and invite you to keep sharing your thoughts as well so some of the reasons we don't understand the complexity of problems and jump in too quickly to solutions we address symptoms rather than the root causes and there's a beautiful model where you, even if you ask why a few times you know why are people traveling so much you know there might be four or five reasons it's a long distance to where they need to get to you know they have the money and the resource and they want to take big trips why is that because of income inequality is it because of the design of our cities is it asking why many many times to get to the, the root cause is really critical to ensure we're really not just putting a band-aid on the problem we fail to engage with the community and people we wish to serve so the tom shoes example why are we really meaningfully talking to the people that we wish to serve and really understanding what they need we fail to work, collaborate, and build on others. Sometimes it's all about me and my project, and I get in my silo, and it's a lot of effort. It requires a lot of energy, as all of you will know who've done social projects, to get something off the ground. And sometimes we don't have time to really collaborate and work with others. And finally, um, our actions are driven more by our own egos or insecurities. I need to have impact. I feel guilty about the state of the world. Why aren't I doing enough? I need to feel good about myself. And so if that's the intention, and the place we're coming from as social impact leaders it can sometimes lead to us making not so great decisions i've had a few more lovely comments come through taking things for granted absolutely may says capitalism patriarchy white supremacy so big issues you know the design of our society that's so profit oriented um you know gender issues race issues around white supremacy big deep deep things there to address Sophia says, when you can't see the measurable impact, you're less careful with your actions. Absolutely. Um, things go wrong. So finding ways to measure becomes really critical. Get feedback. Things go wrong when you're not really looking at the problem. And this is why I love design thinking. And for those that um, aren't aware, design thinking is a beautiful methodology where you really empathize with the people, the core stakeholders, build and test your solutions with them and really collaborate, co-design with them. We can share more about that later. A couple more comments come through. Maria says, the fast daily routine where we don't have time to think. Yeah, we're just so focused on doing and <laughs> rushing from one thing to the next. Filippo says, one of the main problems with the capitalist system is that uh, it has the capacity of showing himself as good when it is a source of problems, for example, with green or gender washing. Exactly. So capitalism encourages us to make money off social issues. So if someone you know, wants to make an impact and you know, wants to buy sustain sustainably, we're kind of incentivized to greenwash because of the system that really promotes profits over everything. So really rich um, comments. Thank you, everyone. So if we jump to the next slide, the question then is, so what do we do about this? And this is a tool called the Impact Gap Canvas. And similar to community mapping, you can use this at any stage of your project, certainly before you start, really recommend it. It really helps you ground yourself in the problem, the complexity of the problem, to really set, your, set yourself up to not make these mistakes to not make assumptions, to not, you know, just address symptoms, but really to not kind of work in silos, but to really embed yourself and find the leverage point, the acupuncture point where you can have greatest impact in the system. And it's a it's a tool you can also use throughout your project because problems are changing, our approach is changing, situations are changing. Life now is very different to life a year ago or two years ago pre-COVID. So as the landscape changes, this is a tool that's helpful to kind of use and reuse throughout your project just to help reorient yourself and ensure that you're really working toward maximum impact. So if we go to the next um, slide, 
we can have a go at doing this ourselves um, just to give you a, a sense the whole impact impact gap canvas is quite thorough you probably spend many hours or weeks even doing it um, but we're going to just do it at a high level just so you get a feel for it um, if you have any questions throughout this process just please drop them in the chat box our hope is you can leave the session just feeling confident that you've got a tool that you can take away and use in your efforts to serve your community and um it's going to be a little bit challenging because we all come from different contexts and you may not know the context at hand but really invite you to share your thoughts in the chat it'll just be really interesting to learn from one another and we'll just pick out a few of the questions from that impact gap canvas as we have a go at this the prompt here is um young people in your community are struggling with their mental health and well-being the pressures of COVID have increased financial stress, job uncertainty, loneliness, fear, and general anxiety. What shall we do about this? So this is the context. We're seeing young people really struggling in our community. You can look at your community map just to really ground yourself in your community. Um, and we're really wondering, you know, what we want to do something about this, but not you know, jump jump into things too quickly. Sophia, acknowledge your comment around the previous slide. We'll share the slides at the end and share you a link um, to jump into this as well. So if we jump into the next slide, so there's kind of three, and maybe we'll actually we will go back. If you go back two slides, sorry, Tamid, back to the, the canvas. Um, so just to kind of ground this exercise, there's kind of three parts. It's probably a bit hard to read the slide, but follow me and then you'll get the hang of this in a sec. On the left side, we've got challenge mapping. So this is really understanding the problem, the challenge, kind of the history of the challenge, um, everything around you know, colonization you can bring into this. Um, why is why is the problem entrenched? Asking the five whys, really getting into what's the problem. On the right side, we've got solution mapping, and this is all about what solutions exist out there. Why are they working? Why are they failing? What's changing in terms of the opportunities we might have to create new solutions as technology develops, as legislative environments change, as consumer behavior changes? And often social entrepreneurs are like, we sometimes spend time learning about the problem or thinking about it, but very rarely, do we find ventures really thoroughly go, why have all these other ventures failed? And let me go and talk to everyone else and build a relationship with them and really understand what exists so I can see where I fit in. So that's the solutions mapping. And in between is landscape gaps. So once you've mapped the challenge, mapped the existing solutions, you then go, so what are the gaps? Who's not being served? What are the obstacles we haven't navigated? And often when you go through this process, you realize, we may, not, we may not need another social venture. We may not need a social business. Sometimes we think we have to start a project, but maybe an existing project needs to be scaled and they need more volunteers and more funds. Maybe some legislation needs to shift to make it easier for, for things to grow. So we need to actually lobby for policy change. Maybe what needs to happen is there's a great solution here, but no one's serving this rural community. So let's take that solution and bring it to this community. Maybe it's a partnership that we need to start, or maybe it's a new venture. But this process really helps you kind of look back systemically at what is it this community or this issue really needs and that landscape gaps kind of sets you up for that as well so that's the process we're going to jump in so if we go two slides ahead again so we have this context right of youth mental health and COVID. our young people are struggling there's anxiety there's mental health challenges financial uncertainty how would you describe the challenge how does it link to other issues what are the causes of the challenge? What is keeping it from changing? How has this challenge changed over time? What is the projected scope of the challenge in the future? Now, I'm conscious these are big questions that we're trying to answer in just a couple of minutes, but invite you just to take a few moments and in the chat box, any thoughts you have on youth mental health in your community during the time of COVID? How does it link to other issues? What are some of the causes in your opinion? You know, what's keeping it stuck? How is the challenge changing? Any thoughts on youth mental health in your community? Drop them in the chat. And while you do that, I'm gonna share a few reflections on my community here in New Zealand, um, just to kind of get us started and uh, invite you to share your thoughts um, as we kind of reflect together. So maybe I'll give you maybe another, another 10, 15 seconds just to reflect quietly on your own. And, Start plugging your thoughts in the chat and and if we jump into the next slide, I'll share some reflections on the community here. 
So mental health is a complex issue with a lot of stigma. There's a full spectrum. You know, on one hand, that's just the daily ups and downs we might feel. On the other hand, there's like very extreme cases of depression or other issues that need professional help. So really acknowledging it's a complex issue with a big spectrum. In our community here in New Zealand, it's actually young males of Indigenous Māori background, Pacific and ethnic minorities in rural areas that are most affected. So really helpful. I live in a city, but really acknowledging the need is actually greatest in certain certain groups and actually in rural areas. Strong links with poverty, family situation, access to opportunities, cultural upbringing, violence, education, inequality. So like many issues really entrenched and we need to acknowledge that if we're addressing mental health, we need to acknowledge many other factors. The causes are multi-layered, situational, biological, intergenerational, the impacts of colonization, particular dynamics amongst peers, even cultural things, you know, around men not being able to express their emotions in a culture where you're meant to be strong, all sorts of multi-dimensional, multi-layered causes. So really acknowledging that. The challenge has increased with time in terms of how is the challenge changing with time. So trends are showing, research is showing with social media use, inequality, even things like climate change, young people are getting more anxious and their mental health is declining even more. So these might be some of the things that you discover when you're doing the challenge landscape mapping. And, you know, as you can see with any one of these, you could research much more deeply um, into, into any of them, you know, even understanding the biological factors, the situational or environmental factors, even really getting into the social media or the other kind of factors that are causing this upward trend of mental health illness. Lots, you know, you can see there's lots of room to go much deeper and this is just giving you kind of a broad view. Maria says, sometimes I feel like we are powerless against society's issues and lose ourselves in our heads totally. So perhaps a lack of confidence or lack of self-belief could be part of the challenge as well. Yeah, Prince acknowledges depression. Absolutely, that's one aspect of, of mental health that we see and sadly is growing now, I think, throughout. Um, so really something we need to, to give energy to. Maria says, hopelessness due to an increase in unemployment. No, it's totally. We look at the job prospects and... And again, there's a mindset or a lack of self-confidence and loss of hope altogether. And, and so we see there's part of it might be the internal piece, but also we need to acknowledge jobs and, and address employment issues and support young people to find jobs um, as well if we're to meaningfully address this. We can't expect in a society where everyone is, yeah, many young people are unemployed to feel really, you know, well. Um, so, so, yeah, great contributions. And if you have other thoughts about your community, please do share them. We'll jump into the solution landscape now, if you go to the next slide. And um, so this is now looking at yeah, what solutions are being tried by all kinds of stakeholders, by academia, by business, by government, by civil society, many NGOs, by the media, the storytelling initiatives, by local community groups, by finance providers. And what can you learn from them? How are all these different groups addressing this issue? What can we learn from them? What's working? What's not working? Um, how can we build off, off their learnings? How do these different solutions address different parts of the problem? So as we said, yeah, there's a part around unemployment. There's a part around kind of mindset and confidence. There's a part on one end, as Prince said, with depression, like really getting help at the extremes for those that need professional help. There's a part just around awareness, around how do you look after yourself? There's all kinds of parts of the problem. There's a biological side, there's a situational side, the design of our cities, there's capitalism, there's all sorts of elements. How, how are these um, solutions addressing different parts of the problem? What parts of the problem aren't addressed potentially? What's changing over time? What new legislation, technology, resources, or other opportunities might impact individual and collective solutions? Just want to acknowledge a few other thoughts in the chat box that have come I think in relation to the challenge landscapes, so young people rely too much on social media, influences their self-esteem. Absolutely, Chun Wei. Asha says, with the increasing use of social media, the fear of missing out increases this feeling, yeah, and there's a feeling of worthlessness when we compare ourselves. So definitely, Paloma says, huge stigma around mental health problems and their meaning. People unwilling to show up their concerns, fears, problems to avoid showing themselves weak. Totally, just the stigma is massive. Um, May says, I'm based in Lebanon and we have suffered and still suffering from economic collapse, the pandemic, the Beirut blast. She's um, a theatre practitioner, amazing, interested in mental health projects, but how do you consider avoiding triggering trauma since we're very much living the trauma and working on sustainable solutions and the funding may not be very big? So a very powerful question. Um, let's come back to your question, May. I'm personally not a mental health expert. It's something that I weave into our work, absolutely. Um, so really want to acknowledge your question. If anyone has thoughts on that question, 
please do share and we can we can come back to it as well. So if we go to the next slide, we'll share, I'll share some reflections on the solution landscape here in New Zealand. And if you've got thoughts or reflections on the solutions in your community or kind of what's working, what's not working, please do share them as well. So some of the existing solutions here include, include, include increasing access to counsellors. So our government is putting a whole lot of money into just getting more counsellors, um, psychologists, psychiatrists into schools, into clinics and being more available. Mental health phone lines is something that we see you know, as, as a kind of resource young people can call someone and get some help. There's promotion of mindfulness and healthy living. So there's more kind of preventative kind of solutions. There's a few campaigns in the media to destigmatize talking about mental health. So someone had flagged earlier, you know, the, st the stigma is huge and there's a few great storytelling initiatives just trying to get people, to, uh, celebrities often, you know, these big rugby players and male athletes, you know, talking about how they're feeling and and their challenges in a vulnerable way. They're having some success, but there's a huge gap between demand and supply. So whilst we have some counsellors, there's just way more people that want to access them than they're available. So there's a huge, there's just not enough help available for the amount of people that are suffering. And even though we have these kind of campaigns to destigmatize, there's still a lot of stigma. I notice, I know in my kind of South Asian community, you know, often we don't even acknowledge mental health as a real thing. So there's still a lot of stigma which is part of the challenge with the solution as well. So if there are any things in your context around the solution, please do um, share them as well. And we'd love to hear. If we jump into the next slide. Um, so now we've got the landscape gaps in between. So we've talked about the problem, the challenge, we've talked about the existing solution. So what's the gaps? And the kinds of questions you wanna ask here is, who or what is not being served? What is the gap between the current problem and current solutions? What would further collective impact of existing efforts? What is missing or not working about existing efforts? What unintended consequences exist? How might these be addressed? What specific opportunities might unlock future impacts? So really going, what's the gap? You know, who's not being served? How can we help them? What's not working about existing solutions? How could we address the things that aren't working so the existing solutions are better rather than just starting our own thing? Let's improve what's out there. Much better use of resources, much more cooperation. Are there some opportunities? Is there a bit of research? You know, I know in the UK, um, a whole I think it's happening in many countries, a whole lot of research is being done into mindfulness and meditation because as the research comes out showing that this is having a positive impact, we can then build it more into curriculum and um, school education policy can shift. And as we research positive solutions and actually can be really confident that they work, that gives policymakers confidence to um you know, create policies, is there a bit of research, is there a partnership, what are the opportunities? And just acknowledging a few comments that have come through Truch and Wei, launch some social media challenge to invite more youth to show their confidence and inner beauty. So that's beautiful. No, while social media can be a challenge, we can use it as a platform to invite people to really yeah, build their confidence as well. Nicole says, mental health in my community is hard to acknowledge. Adults believe that it's only the whip and harsh words that can get someone in line. I believe that counselling and mental health are an entity. Totally, Nicole, and I think you're definitely not alone in that. Just even acknowledging the challenge is very, very, so much um, of the work that's needed initially, let alone kind of providing the solutions. I think the other really useful thing with this comment Nicole's made, and it comes back to the community map, is if, if you acknowledge there's a lot of stigma in your community and you want to launch a solution, it's going to be critical that you frame or communicate that in a way that doesn't turn people off. Yes, there's education work, but even in your solution, how can you maybe not call it mental health, but, you know, talk about it in a way that's, hey, let's just get together and have a picnic or let's play some sport or let's come and talk about healthy living, you know? And if there's a way we can we can frame it that reaches people, that, that's also really important to keep in mind and where knowing your community and your audience is really critical. Um, if we jump into the next slide, we'll share a few thoughts um, on the kind of situation here. So one of the gaps is enabling young people just to know how to support their peers when they're down. So there's some kind of support if you're really not doing okay, but if, you're, if your friends are just a bit down, you know, how do you how do you support them and be a good listener? That, that's a gap. Another gap is around young people not knowing how to manage their own emotions and minds. This is not taught in schools, you know? There's nothing really, not much around emotional intelligence, mental well-being, resilience. That's a, a gap in education. There's just a huge funding gap. So there's many mental health charities doing good work, but they just don't have the funding to grow initiatives. Um, 
an opportunity exists for more research to show the impact of existing mental health initiatives and to help them get more funds or support and scale. So, so already from this, you can see, you know, if I just jumped into my community and go, look, I want to help young people with mental health, I might just start a social media campaign. I've just seen so many young people with the best of intentions go, let me do a social media campaign or let me, yeah, jump in, you know, create my own mental health first aid toolkit and teach people how to look after their mental health. But, but really, when you start looking at the problem and the complexity of it and the existing solution, it's very clear that while the things that are going to have the most impact and really serve our communities in the greatest way might not be the obvious things. It might be, you know, jumping into schools and influencing curriculum. It might be going off and trying to do some research in a field or seeing who's willing to do some research. It might be yeah, lobbying for policy change or just starting an initiative to help people learn how to be good listeners, empathetic listeners. So really just spending time in the complexity is nothing like it, nothing that beats talking to people and really getting a sense of what's happening on the ground and what's needed. Um, acknowledge a few comments that have come through. We won't have time to read all of them. There's many, many lovely solutions, so definitely do read the chat box. But just to call out a couple of them, um, there is a need to bridge the gap so that adults accept that mental health issues are real. So big kind of education mm -hmm. aspect. Um, yeah, acknowledging role models and people that young people are influenced by. Nice comment from Reese. Organizations can launch mental health training initiatives. So how could businesses actually, or any kind of organization, train and support their staff? Um, May's got a, a number of lovely comments here as well kind of broad issues. We need infrastructure. We need to help people fix their homes, offer food. It's not just about mindfulness and self-care if someone's hungry. You know, you've got to address that bigger issue of poverty. You know, so really looking at this broadly <clears throat> and looking at the wider issues that need to be addressed as well as the specific mental health issues. And as you can see, all of our community contexts are so different. So really, you've got to tailor this to what's needed in your community. If your community is just really struggling to eat, that might be the thing that's, that's really the pressing issue. And, and through that, you can kind of alleviate anxiety about, you know, will I have food on the, on the plate? And that might be what's needed. Um, so if we jump to the final, I think we've got one final slide. So how do you actually understand a problem and get started? What do you do in practice? So a few um, just thoughts to leave you with nothing like working interning spending time in the set if you can spend if you're committed to addressing and serving your community in your in your lifetime and taking a really long-term view spending a few years working for a mental health charity in this case or working in local schools being around the young people that are struggling like nothing like getting an internship really spending substantial time in the sector observe interview speak with people you know recent mentioned design thinking a lot of that's about really you know cultivating empathy for those most affected by the challenge immerse yourself in it Connect with people, academics, futurists, investors, policymakers. You know, give people a call, spend time with them, learn from them. Seek conflicting perspectives. People don't agree on these things. Even in our group, we've got different thoughts. So it's really good to hold different perspectives. Challenge your own thinking. Um, talk to people that, that you, did, you disagree with to, to push you, your thinking as well. Bring awareness to your own passions, interests, strengths, worldview, life experience. It's not just about the problem and the solutions. At the end of the day, where can you be most effective? If what's needed is research, but you're just not passionate about research, you know, what's your part to play as well? So self-awareness work is really key. And yeah, drawing mind maps, pictures can really help. The learning never stops. It's really an ongoing process. And if there's any other thoughts you have on how to understand a problem, I invite you to share that in the chat box. And really thank you all for your awesome contributions. We'll share a link to kind of the full canvas. Really, um, yeah, hopefully you've you've understood the value of it and just the importance throughout the section of really grounding in community and really understanding uh, before jumping in too quickly um, to have the best impact. And all that, with that, I'll hand back to you, Tami. Brilliant. Thank you, Shruti, um, for sharing. That, that was a brilliant, um, uh, uh, deep dive into impact gap emphasizing. Um We are coming to the end of our session uh, and I just wanted to summarize and reiterate. So we, we covered community mapping and we covered impact gap canvassing. And we know that 90 minutes um, is nowhere near enough time to cover those two tools and to, to go into some of the questions that it asks and to spend some time trying to answer the questions that, that is being asked. So we really implore you to spend time, maybe after this session, uh, maybe not today as it's a Sunday, but maybe sometime next week, just to, to revisit the tools, 
revisit your community map, um, revisit those questions that Sruti asked in terms of the gaps, um, and and really think about uh, those questions, particularly if you're if you're really trying to start addressing an issue or you're already addressing an issue and in, an injustice. Um, so for the next uh, sort of ten to fifteen minutes of the session. We're just going to cover some some next steps and resources that you can use. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Shayon to just talk a little bit about Peace First and what we have to offer. Um, thank you so much, Tamid, and thank you so much, Ruthie. That was a very interesting and brilliant session, and it was so good seeing everyone on the call engaging and also um, linking everything that they learned to the community map that had been learned earlier. So in terms of next steps, you might be having questions as to how do I get started? So we've learned about how to map our communities. We've learned about how to identify the right problems and even devise the right solution. So how do I get started? Um, one of the ways that you could actually start is by creating your project with Peace First. Now, Peace First um, started a couple of years ago by it was started by um, a couple of students at Harvard University and they were young very young and had ideas that could transform their community but they realized that every single time they shared these ideas with adults they either got a pat in the back like oh well done with no accompanying resources to actually get the work done or they got um, feedback like you're too young that's just too young and I, I don't know how it is in your region, but because you're a young person and you have an idea that could change your community or even country or even your region, um, I'm not sure of how many times you hear, oh, you're too young, or you hear, oh, well done, but no accompanying resources as it were. So Peace First started to support young people um, between the ages of 13 to 25 who have intentions to transform their community. You might have the idea at hand already. You might have even started it. And it's okay if you don't have the idea, if you've not started it, you just have the intention. So when you visit our website, peacefirst.org, you'll be taking through a challenge very easy with accompanying resources and tools. And you would also be given a mentor depending on the region that you are in. So if you're in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, I could be your mentor. Or my colleague Uluwasho. If it's in the UK, Tamid could be your mentor. If it's Asia, if it's in the Europe, um, Europe, um, or Canada, US, and also Latin America, and even the Middle East and North Africa. So wherever it is that you are, there's someone um, that's going to coach you depending on your region and also take you through that challenge. And at the end of your challenge, if you want some funding to just start your project, to get access to um, up to $250 to actually start a social change project and implement it in your community. Um, so basically that's um, what Peace First is about. And we are going to be sharing with you our email addresses at the end and also the link to the website so that you can get started. Back to you, Kamit. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Shruti, do you want to talk a little bit about Global Shapers? Yeah, so so one of the community I'm representing here at the summit is called the Global Shapers Community. It's an initiative run by the World Economic Forum. And in cities all around the world, we have hubs of young people, predominantly in kind of 20 to 30, 33, um, I think as young as 18 in some places as well, that come together to mobilize for local impact, but think globally and connect globally. So, um, Definitely recommend checking out the website. I've been a part of the community for about six, seven years. It's really just a wonderful network of young people like those you're connected with here that you can really collaborate with. It's a community you can kind of tap into to help scale your project, access resources, access yeah, support. So check out globalshapers.org. You can find your local community, your local hub. If there isn't one, yeah, the hub community is growing quite quickly. So you can see what the nearest one is and see if you can plug in um, join or, or get support from them in some way as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Shruti. Um, so, yeah, that is that for our session. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, uh, you can have access to that the Impact Gap um, canvassing resource by clicking on the, the link below here. And then also peacefirst.org, you can, if you go onto our website, there is a tab that says resources. And on that tab, it has community mapping, but it also has a plethora of other resources that you can use that can really help your journey into, into, into social action and social entrepreneurship. Um, we've also noted down our emails in case you want to reach out to us. And as Sheon mentioned, if you're in the UK and Europe, um, feel free to reach out to me. 
um, specifically if you have a project there and, and you need support from Peace First and Sub-Saharan Africa, Shion's the person to go to. Um, if you're from any other region, definitely still drop us an email uh, and we can connect you with the right person. And then we've got Shruti's email at the bottom here as well. We've also got some links to our social media. So do follow um, Peace First on uh, Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. Um, something to note as well, we have an Instagram live session in every region where we chat to a social action project from that region once a month, which is uh, a really great uh, initiative that we have. Um, brilliant. So what I'm going to do now as well uh, for you guys is share the... Uh, I've just dropped the link. Yeah, I've just dropped the oh. link in the chat. I have okay. one. Um, we've got a few minutes left. So as as we share these resources, we can our emails are in that slide. Just invite you all. Just we've had a pretty big ninety minutes. If you want to just take twenty seconds, just to take a couple of deep breaths, and just reflect from this ninety minutes, like what are you taking away? Like if there was one takeaway, one thing you've learned, uh, or a couple things, you're welcome to share. We'd love for you just to reflect and drop that in the chat box and it'll just be a chance to help consolidate the learning but also just to see what each other has learned to kind of reinforce our learning as well so um if you're happy to we'd love to hear kind of what's your takeaway or what are a couple of takeaways from the session um and in the meanwhile we'll share all the links in the chat box as well and um anything out any other questions just um drop them in and we can answer them in the last couple of minutes What are your takeaways, Shayun and Tamin? Yeah, um, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed the session, and uh, something to a few takeaways for me is to really think about the the landscape gaps, really think about the solution gaps, and actually think about who else is pr providing the solutions and what are they doing wrong. That's that's <laughs> that's a really great question to ask, and not a lot of people ask that question. Um, also, just some tips from you guys in terms of facilitating sessions. I learned a lot from you guys. I guess for me, thank you so much, Ruthie. It was really good facilitating with you. And I think that one of the takeouts that I took out was that as a social entrepreneur, I shouldn't just assume or make the mistake of um, thinking I have all the answers just because I've identified the problem. And so I'm taking it out of here to genuinely collaborate with the local community that I am serving by talking to them, by trying to identify the root causes before I then devise a solution that can truly serve them. So thank you so much. Awesome. I've got a few coming in through the chat that we'll read for those of you on YouTube. Lester says, I've learned that despite the distance and different places we come from, there will be similar cases out there and we can use these as references to make better change. Absolutely. How do we learn from each other? Yes, there's different contexts, but even then, such similar challenges we're all facing. Beautiful, Esther. Julia says, fantastic efforts to aid, fantastic efforts to aid where it is actually needed. So find where the actual problem is. May says, thank you for today's conversation, reminding me of building up on existing initiatives so we can work together rather than split resources. Lovely. Um, Lovely. One of my takeaways is, yeah, there's a lot of resources in my local community that perhaps are overlooked at times um, that are kind of there for us to tap into if we just kind of see the opportunity. So really to, to look around, um, yeah, what's what's available and, and make best use of that. May also, yeah, re uh, recommends, I'm a big fan of Paolo Freire as well. He's got an amazing book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed um so yeah lovely recommendation if there are other, other book recommendations from anyone feel free to drop them in the chat as well reese says know what your community needs so you can see where the gaps are lovely brilliant okay um yeah, so we have a minute left. I uh, just wanted to reiterate, thank you all for being so attentive throughout the session and sharing such brilliant insights uh, and thoughts and questions. Um, had, us, had, our, had our minds really, really engaging throughout the session. 
And it's always great to see as a facilitator, seeing such great engagement. I hope you've learned the resources um, uh, uh, and I hope you've learned a lot from, from the session. And um, again, do, do make sure you take away um, those resources and, and look into them when, when you have a lot more time. And also uh, do look into us at Peace First and the Global Shapers as well um, to, to build, build, it, build your community, which I think is a, is a really important note as well for, for your social entrepreneurship journey. Um, brilliant. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, we'll end the session here. I don't know if we like cut off in, in 10 seconds, but thank you all for joining. Bye, everyone. Thanks all. Thanks, everyone. Bye.